I would like to invite Abiola. She is a senior at Temple, and she had the amazing chance to go at sea for a full semester, visiting 11 countries, and she will share her experience with, her with us today. Thanks. Hello. This evening, I'm going to talk about the importance of education in development. Once upon a time, one man somehow succeeded in making an entire nation his personal property. The man in question is King Leopold III of Belgium, and the nation is what is today known as the Congo. How did the king of such a small European country carve out a whole nation for himself and leave one of the darkest legacies of colonialism in Africa? Well, he scoped out the land and he figured out what he wanted, hired an agent to do the groundwork for him. The agent was Henry Morton Stanley, an Englishman well acquainted with the African hinterland. With a combination of charisma, fancy gifts, and military prowess, Morton was able to convince the local chiefs to sign away their rights and their land. King Leopold then used these treaties to persuade the rest of the free world of his right to the Congo and proceeded to conquer the land. Of course, Africans did not just sit back, fold their arms, and watch their land be pillaged. There is the seldom told story of Chief Mulame Nyama and Chief Mzansu, just two of the many chiefs that fought to the death for their people's freedom. Now, in writing this speech, I started to get carried away and I had to pull myself back and remind myself that I was not called here to give you a history lesson. So I will highlight one point from the story and discuss how this is relevant today. Looking at the story of the Congo, it struck me just how critical the signed treaties were to Leopold's success. Those treaties were signed by illiterate chiefs who barely understood what they were signing. They could not read. Of course, it would be too simplistic to completely attribute the colonization of the Congo to the illiteracy of the chiefs. But the part that literacy, illiteracy played here is real and undeniable. That is the power that illiteracy had over us back in the day. But our continent is still held captive to the, captives, to the evils of illiteracy today. 38% of sub-Saharan African adults that is, people from ages 15 and older are illiterate. Compare this with the world average of 17%. Our continent is far behind. And these numbers have not been adjusted for gender. When adjusted, we find that women account for a relatively larger portion of the group. When broken down by country, we see some even more alarming results. For example, 71% of adults in Burkina Faso are illiterate. How exactly do these figures impact us? We can all agree that development is critical to the betterment of the human condition, right? But what exactly is development? Economists have for the longest time defined development in financial terms or in terms of technological advancements. Even though these factors are very important, Development involves so much more, and Nobel laureate Amartya Sen made a compelling case for this when he defined development as freedom. Development is only the means to an end, and the end that we actually want to obtain is freedom. The high percentages of illiteracy that I mentioned earlier should bother us, because education is one of the freedoms that determine development and the rate of illiteracy is an impediment to people's freedom. Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to education. According to the UNESCO Declaration on the Right to Basic Education as a Fundamental Human Right, the right to education is an internationally recognized right in its interrelationship with the right to freedom, to in, in, in its interrelationship with the right to development. So far, I have dwelt more on ideologies, so I will move on and talk about the real gains that education produces. Interestingly, these gains are in line with the other freedoms presented by Amartya Sen. 
Here, I will quote facts obtained from the Center for Global Development and the 2011 UNESCO Education for All report. Education leads to improved health. With education, people are better prepared to prevent disease and to use health services more effectively. For example, young people who have completed primary education are less than half as likely to contract HIV as those with little or no schooling. Educated mothers have healthier children. Education leads to democracy and the political stability by supporting the growth of civil society and allowing people to learn about their rights and acquire the skills and knowledge necessary to exercise them. Education also has the potential to help break the vicious cycle of armed conflict and poverty and replace the fear of war with the hope of a viable future. In fact, an important starting point for conflict prevention and post-conflict reconstruction is to recognize that education matters. And lastly, education does impact even the almighty gross national product. In many poor countries, with each additional year of schooling, people earn 10% higher wages. These earnings, in turn, contribute to the national economic growth. No country has ever achieved continuous and rapid growth without reaching an adult literacy rate of at least 40%. So if this is a good indicator, what hope is there for countries like Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Niger, and so on? I hope by now I have been able to convince you that education is key. But whose job is it to provide this education? According to UNICEF, states are ultimately accountable for providing basic education to their citizens. States, governments, everybody's quiet. <laughs> Every, <laughs> we are a generation disenchanted with the idea of governments, but I'm a proponent of it, especially when it comes to education. No other organization has as much potential to solve the problems of illiteracy as the government. As UNESCO says, it will take decisive action by governments around the world to solve the problems of illiteracy. And the government needs competent people like you and me to solve these issues. For too long, we have wallowed in the sea of apathy. We have blamed all our woes on the government. But who makes up the government? Is it not the citizens? And if all the good people run away from government, how will things ever get better? If Dora Fumili of Nigeria had stayed out of government, do you realize how many people would have died from the use of fake drugs today? Some responsibilities just have to be taken care of by government, and we need to be those people in government. I recognize that not everyone is called to solve the problems of education. There are other pertinent issues like food security, unemployment, and conflict that must be tackled in order for our society to move forward. But I will, however, encourage us as a society to create awareness about the importance of education and pressure our governments to prioritize it. The Persian American Bara Maskanian once said, ignorance and apathy are two of the most expensive, deadly, and destructive weapons of mass destruction in the world. The cure for ignorance is education. The cure for apathy? I'll leave you to figure that one out. I have been told many times that my ideas on government are idealistic, but this is with good reason. Last semester, I traveled the world on a floating university. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was the dis distinguished lecturer on the program, and whenever he got up to address the students, he would look at us, giggle in his signature Desmond Tutu style, and tell us how much potential we had to change the world. On one occasion, Desmond Tutu told us, he said, continue to be idealistic. Dream, dream the craziest dreams. Now, when Desmond Tutu tells you that you can change the world and you should be idealistic, you should just say yes, sir, and just go for it. But for me, his statements did not particularly have an impact. Until one day, it just, it just clicked. 
He was talking to me. I need to be idealistic. His belief in me helped me to believe in myself. But this message is not just for me. In fact, I sat there in that room and heard that message for a time as this, where I can stand in front of African leaders and encourage you. The message is for you. It's for you. It's for you. It's for you. <laughs> I hope you realize how much potential is in each and every one of us to effect positive change. We have the power to accomplish great feats, and we cannot allow anyone to tell us different. Thank you.